start my remarks. Hi everybody, I'm Rich Martini, the author of Flipside, A Tourist Guide on How to Navigate the Afterlife, which is coming out in Delhi this month, being translated. Well, what am I saying? Translated. It's in English. <laughs> um, and this, this guy, uh, Prashant Solomon, is publishing it. So, Prashant Solomon. Very, very good. And I'm also the author of uh, It's a Wonderful Afterlife, Volume 1 and 2. And just a rough thing about me, I just wanted to mention Carol brief, briefly, because I was there. I was there not only in this lifetime, but I was there in a previous lifetime. And when I started this research as a skeptical filmmaker, we all know what the word skeptical means. It means believing outside the common thought. The word skeptic means someone who doesn't believe in the, in the current school of thought. So you're all skeptics here today. I just want to add that. And as a skeptical filmmaker, at some point I found myself making a documentary about Michael Newton's work. Michael Newton, Journey of Souls, Destiny of Souls, a psychologist from Los Angeles who was a skeptic, didn't believe in past life regressions, and at some point in his practice discovered much to his chagrin, that people not only remembered previous lifetimes, but he could verify that they existed in a previous lifetime. And somewhere in the 1960s, he had this odd experience of having a woman come in and very depressed, and he said, well, take me to the source of your depression. And she suddenly catapulted her consciousness, her mind, into the between lives realm, as he called it. She was with her soul group, the people she normally incarnates with, and she saw them all in his office. And Newton said, what do you mean? Is this in the past? Is this in the present? Is this in the future? She said, no, I see them all here now. And we all agreed that I wouldn't come here together with them. And so therefore, she suddenly was no longer sad or depressed about not having any friends because she recognized them all. Okay. That catapulted Newton into this research. And as Dr. Grayson said to me personally, when I presented my findings uh, from Flipside at the University of Virginia, he said, Rich, hypnosis is not a valid scientific tool. It's just not something we consider valid science. I said, okay, well, other than the fact that everybody was saying the same things under deep hypnosis, no matter who was doing the sessions, Deep hypnosis being four to six hour sessions, sometimes over the course of days, where people would not only ask about a previous lifetime, they'd say, now let's go to that previous lifetime and let's go to the day, the moment after you die. Where do you go? They're neutral questions. I mean, there is a construct in there, but the question's neutral. Where do you go? People could say, I don't go anywhere. People could say, I go to heaven. I go anywhere. But they consistently say the same thing. As a filmmaker, I started filming this phenomenon 10 years ago. Because I thought, wait, this is great. Cameras can film six, eight hours, 10 hours. And if they let me in the room, I could see if people were manipulating people into these answers. And I've filmed 35 sessions so far. I've done five myself. And people say the same things consistently, no matter what their religion no matter what their background, they talk about the journey in the same terms. I choose the people to study. They're people that I know personally, so when they start talking about their lifetime growing up or what it was, while they're under quote unquote hypnosis, because for those of us who've ever done hypnosis, you know it's more like a guided meditation. You're never under, your conscious mind is always arguing with you saying, you're making this up. But in my case, in all 35 cases that I've filmed, when asked, where would you like to go after this previous lifetime, they all say the same thing. I want to go home. When I first heard it, I thought, excuse me? You mean like Chicago, what, Northbrook, Illinois, where I'm from? What do you mean home? Mind you, they've just remembered a previous lifetime, very dramatic, sometimes details that I can search for and verify while I'm sitting in the chair, the name of the town, the year, 
Most hypnotherapists don't ask these questions because I'm in the room with my camera. I give the therapist a list of questions I want to know. How deep can we go in this moment where they start remembering a previous lifetime? Can we ask questions about their house, their family, etc., etc.? And while they're talking, I'm often over there in the corner verifying some of the details of what they say. And once I started to realize that I could verify details of somebody from a previous lifetime, then I started to think to myself, well, what other details could I verify? And that's where Dr. Grayson comes in. Because when I presented these cases, I talked about Michael Newton's thousands of cases. I talked about Helen Wambus' cases, a psychologist from New Jersey, who also had a similar experience with hypnosis, asking people, why they came to the planet, why they became a man or a woman, why they chose their parents. And she published her results a decade before Newton. So there's two psychologists who've done extensive studies on people under deep hypnosis saying the same things about the afterlife. Okay? And somewhere in there I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting if I could supply some of the questions? And so when Dr. Grayson said, you know, science doesn't consider hypnosis a valid tool, Ian Stevenson was quite against it, I thought, well, what is a valid science tool? Well, near-death experiences. You have people who had these experiences, they've been cataloged, they've been studied. You can talk to the people about their experiences. I saw David Bennett here, and I interviewed David Bennett for my book. He wrote Voyage of Purpose. If you're familiar with his near-death experience, it's quite startling. Not only did he see experiences of his lifetime, but he also saw into the future what would happen to him. Very dramatic stuff. But while I'm doing this research and while I'm asking these people under hypnosis where the, whether, what happened to them, I realized I could ask near-death experiences under hypnosis what happened. You see? You start with this premise, very simple. The brain is a great recorder. It records everything. We know that, right? That's science. The brain has an the delete key. Despite people acting like it does, there is no delete key. Everything that I'm saying to you right now, unfortunately, will be somewhere in your brain stored. Everything that happened to you as a baby, everything that happened to you in the womb, is stored information, stored in this gray matter. Everything that happened to you while you were sleeping is stored here. We don't have access to it, do we? It's not kind of confusing, you know, you had a dream. Well, that's weird. I had a dream I thought I saw Uncle Bill. You know, it's funny, Uncle Bill had like this thing about him, he was smoking a cigarette again. And he said to me, I'm fine, I'm okay. Okay, well that's a dream. What have we done whenever we talk about dreams? We just dismiss it as if, oh, you know, flight of fancy. Uh-uh, it's there. And if you ask people questions about their dream, they can answer it. First, they'll try not to. I've done this quite a bit. So I discovered in my own work, because of my familiarity with the process of hypnosis, and of asking questions to people, lead them at least to a previous lifetime, and then to talk about the life between lives, okay? I'm not a psychologist, I am not a hypnotist, I'm a filmmaker. I do ask questions for people. But I realized I could condense what was being asked into one-on-one -on -one sessions. And it just happened spontaneously. I was talking to somebody about their near-death experience, and I said, so what happened to you? And they started telling me the story. And then I'd say, well, hold on a second. Can you stop it right there? Just pause your memory. OK. Look around you, in your mind's eye. See if there's anybody else around you. And of course, you know, I could see their brain swimming. Like, what? You know, this, is, this happened to me when I was 10. It's still accessible. What well, my caveat is to say, just say the first thing that comes to mind. Try not to judge it. Very hard to do. It's very hard to do in life, and it's very hard to do when you're remembering, especially something difficult, troubling. Near-death experiences usually happen in a traumatic way at some point. So I'm not asking people to remember the event 
prior. But I'm asking that for them to remember the event as it happened. As you were traveling and you asked neutral questions, were you floating or were you being pulled to something? Or what was your experience? Did you see anybody else around you? Is it night? Is it day? The light. So those things you talked about in your, in your talk. The light. Okay? We've all heard this term unconditional love. In your case, you mentioned feelings of well-being. Well -being, and I think Dr. Grayson talks about that as well. But what I hear consistently are the words, I have a feeling of unconditional love. So I'll ask, so you saw yourself going to the light, and once you get into the light, what's the feeling? I feel warm. Okay, describe that. What's that warmth about? I feel loved. What kind of love? Happy love. Tragic love, sad we know. It's a word that we can't even define, love. And they'll say, unconditional love. I've heard it maybe 20 different times. Now, what is that? It's not a term that we use in every, you know, could I have a double shot of espresso and give me some of that unconditional love over there in the corner? It's not something we use, you know, colloquially, really. It's not a term that people use on TV or in movies or in songs. I've never heard it. I mean, we've all heard it, but I'm just saying, if you just sort of like pay attention to the word, unconditional love, what is it? Well, it's the opposite of what? Conditional love. So what's conditional love? I love you if you, <laughs> if you obey me. I love you if you reflect that love back to me. I love you if you agree with everything I'm saying. I love you if you want to build a wall around the country. Whatever your love is, it's conditional love. But my point is, when you have people talk about a feeling that they don't experience in their lives at all, how important is that when they finally experience it? And doesn't it make sense to say, stop, feel it. What is it? Memorize it, feel it in your body. Now look around. Is there anybody else here? Almost always. Almost always. Sometimes people say, I don't really sense anybody. You can say, well, let's go further down until you do sense somebody. Okay. Who is it? So male or female? Or, or both? Sometimes they say both. I'm sensing somebody that's not androgynous, not male or female. Okay. Their brain is, I can see their brain like going, what? What is that? And I'm saying, just don't judge it. Whatever, whatever comes to mind. Allow it to be. So what I'm saying is I've been doing this thing where, and my new book is called Hacking the Afterlife, and it's about these interviews with people under deep hypnosis. And then I discovered, because people under deep hypnosis are saying the same things that people that I'm interviewing have had near-death experiences are saying, right? They're consistent stories about that light, that threshold that they go through, sometimes an experience on the other side that's beautiful, sometimes there's grass, even Alexander, Dr. Alexander's thing had included people's dancing. Now it's important to point this out, and this is the subject of my talk, which is the architecture of the afterlife. No account is the same. As many accounts as you've heard, none are identical. <laughs> Bless you. Sometimes you have people say, well, I had this, you know, the feeling is identical, unconditional love, that's a great feeling, and we can agree on that. And people say, when, I'm, when they say, oh, I'm going, I want to go home during the sessions, try to define home. Even two twins can't define the same home. We all understand it when somebody says, oh, I feel so comfortable, I feel like I'm home. Gary. But that idea of home isn't something that's definable, is it? It's, it's relative up to our perspective. And I think this is an important element of NDEs. And it's an important element that we have to acknowledge, and should acknowledge, in this research. Light is neither particle nor wave. It's both, isn't it? You try to define it, it's undefinable. It's both, okay? We have to agree on that. 
We can argue about it, but we have to agree it's both things. So when someone experiences a heaven-like experience, it's unique to them. We can say it was a heaven-like experience. So, in the work that I've been doing, I, found, I find this architecture. Now, my father was a, an architect who, who studied, uh, he was at the uh, Holabird Root in Chicago. And so I grew up around blueprints. And at some point, I saw that blue thing sitting on the table. And he said, oh, that's, that's our neighbor's house. That's the letters of the block. Really? That piece of paper is, oh, I see. I grew up with a mandala above my bed. My uncle had served in Burma during World War II. Sent home a Tibet mandala. Something I was not aware of until I was in Tibet. I was making a film in Tibet with Robert Thurman. Circling Mount Kailash. Which, by the way, you mentioned the seven places that are sacred. Also Kailash. If you circle Kailash, all your sins are washed away. So, good time to start sinning again. Has that been around Kailash? But, I grew up under this mandala. You've seen them, sand mandalas, the Tibetan monks, they come and they do the, the little coloring and stuff like that. What is that? It's a blueprint. It's a blueprint for a building. It's a, a four-dimensional building. Because in your meditative process, you create that building. You're looking at, you know how a blueprint looks from the top? That's what a mandala is. It's a blueprint for a three-dimensional building. Each one has a different entrance, and as, as you study Tibetan Buddhism, you learn how to meditate so that you can build it in your mind's eye. You're doing that kind of work with your brain, so that you can stand here and also be standing in your mandala. And you inhabit the mandala with all the people that you admire, the holy people, let's say. We can all do that. It's not something that the Tibetan monks have a corner on. When I say to you, think of your parents' home. Think of your happiest day in your life. Think of the day that you met your significant other. You all have a three-dimensional image of it. And so what I say is, so go, go to the next dimension. Add, add the feeling what it was like sitting in the chair. Was it hot? Was it cold? What was the emotion like? Blueprints are these two-dimensional things that ultimately become buildings. I'm a screenwriter. I've written and directed like eight theatrical films. Right. Nobody's ever heard of me, so they must not be any good. I'm just kidding. Some of them are pretty good. But a screenplay <laughs> is a mandala. You write the words, you put them in order, you have them in your mind, and then when you show up in the set, it's a whole different experience because you, know, you didn't get the actor that you were looking for, and blah, blah, blah. And then when you show up in the theater, it's a different experience. It goes from that mental image to the physical. I'm just pointing it out. My mother was a concert pianist. One day I took her to downtown Chicago. I bought her the score for the Rachmaninoff Three, one of the most difficult piano pieces in history. My mother read the score in the car on the way home, sat down, and played it for me. She had never seen it, never heard it. But that's how good she was as a sight reader. When she sees notes, she saw notes, she saw them and heard them. So what are we talking about when we have a near-death experience? We're talking about people who've seen the other side of the blueprint. You've seen it sort of in its energetic construction. That's my point. And the idea being, and this is where my research has now taken off, which is I'm saying that construct exists over there. There are libraries. We've all heard about the Akashic Records, right? We've all heard some version of that. I've been there. I've filmed 35 different people who've been there. But it's different for each person. So when you say, like, well, I'm in a giant library, it's really strange. It's, there's stacks of books everywhere. Open one up, take it out. What do you see? Everybody says something different. Some, some people say, well, it's not a book, it's a scroll. I'm looking at a scroll. One guy, just I interviewed about a month ago, was looking at microfiche. He was like, I'm going through the card catalog, I'm looking at all my lifetimes, and I'm seeing what's missing. 
This was an interview I had done about life planning sessions. Okay? It's just part of the architecture of the afterlife. We all have life planning sessions. We all refer to our previous lifetimes. How did I do? Oh, that Viking era, I really hated that. We all choose who we're going to be, roughly. Choose our parents, roughly. The idea of these reports are consistent. It's not that I'm, it's not a belief. It's not my philosophy. These are consistent reports from people under deep hypnosis or my talking to somebody who's had this experience and asking, or I've allowed something new into my work, which is mediumship. I had a medium contact me out of the blue. Is that anything out of the blue? <laughs> Jennifer Schaefer, uh, jenniferschaefer.com, very interesting woman who works with law enforcement agencies to help find missing persons. She had read my books and said, you know, I'm really interested in your work. And I, I said, basically, you know, mediums predict the future. And in my study, I see that the future is not set. It's, it's relatively different, but it's not in concrete. We have likely outcomes. This is what everyone tells me in this research. And we have free will. And free will dictates what's going to happen. So you can change your mind. You may have signed up to play the role of researcher in a difficult place to do research. And you can change your mind. I don't want to do that. That's too difficult. Or you can have courage. Because you're learning courage in each lifetime. Or you've chosen how to learn. Whatever it is. I'm saying, I'm not saying that's you. I'm just saying that's what the research shows. You choose lifetimes that have different aspects of what you want to learn. So, consistently people are saying this. And I realized when the medium called me, she said, well, I've been working with missing persons. Um, she works with Bill Bratt, the commissioner of New York. And I said, all right, well, tell me a couple of cases that you saw. And she did. Okay, very, very dramatic. I, I appreciate your talent. Uh, and I was being resistant, but then I said, well, wait a second, I've been working for 30 years on a film about Amelia Earhart. How would you like to work on the most famous missing person case in history? She said, I'm in. So I took my camera over and I filmed her, but not under the construct that we normally meet with mediums. How many people have met a medium here in your lifetime? How many are mediums? No, okay, so a lot of people have met mediums. And generally, you know how it works. Medium will say, I'm feeling this, I'm hearing this, or I'm seeing this, I'm sensing this about you. And they'll start talking to your relatives. And they'll say, and they'll ask you questions. Was it, did you have so-and-so or that person? Um, my friend Dave is here, and we, I've got a mutual friend who passed away. While I was doing an interview with her on German television, and I got a text that our friend Billy Meyer had died, she turned to me and said, who's Billy Meyer? I said, oh my God, he's my friend who just passed away. She said, he's standing over here. And he wants you. And listen, they don't show up because they don't have other stuff to do. He showed up so I would talk to his kids. But she said, he's got a, a daughter and two sons. The daughter needs your help. Okay, Billy, I'm happy to help. The point being, if Billy can come and talk to me, can I go and talk to Billy? You see? Can I go talk to Amelia Earhart? It's very simple. And the answer could be, no, you can't. And I'm open to that. That's fine. I could go sit in her office. I could turn the camera on and say, well, so now tell me. You know, where, where were you? And I've been working on an Amelia Earhart picture for 30 years. And so believe me, I know more than any. I've worked on all the films that are made about her. I know more than anybody I've ever met about this particular person. So I know what happened to her, roughly. So I can ask detailed questions that nobody knows about. Nobody knows the answer to. For example, was your who was the love of your life, and was that a painter? Now most people, most researchers, would have an answer, and I know when they answer the question correctly. It was a woman that she met. It was ten years younger than her that she kept it a secret romance for all those years. Her husband was totally aware of it. It was an open marriage. I already know the answer to that because that's the kind of research I do. 
So when, when Amelia confers, he confirms that through a medium, I know I'm in the right place. And that's my point. And ultimately, Amelia told me some things about her death, which is what my question was. I had heard different reports. So what happened to you? She told me specific details about the manner of her dying that kind of blew my mind, as, as the medium was saying. I was thinking to myself, that can't possibly be true. Okay? I'll tell you what it is. Are you curious? Yes. All right, so, <laughs> so she, no, she, I heard that she had died. I heard that she was executed in Saipan. I'd heard that, and I'd been to Saipan, and I'd filmed 15 people who saw her there. Okay, let's just start there. And at some point, I heard either that she had been beheaded or, or shot, like many people were. And beheading in that culture, in that time period, was the fastest way to get to the afterlife. So, you know, it wasn't a torturous thing. I'm, I'm just saying. I think it's torturous, but still. So I'm asking, and the answer was no, I died of dysentery. Okay, I would heard that as well. It was a book in 1963 It was written about that. Somebody had said that. Okay, so I said, all right. So where's your body? And she said, well, two GIs dug me up. Two soldiers dug me up. I had heard that too. The same book, Fred Gerner's book, talks about these two GIs who had dug her up. And he interviewed those two guys. She said, but they only recovered my arm. And I said, what, what? What do you mean they only got your arm? They dug you up. Yes, but they only recovered my arm. Now listen, I'm a sane person. I'm sitting in a room in a medium's office in Manhattan Beach, California. I'm talking to what it seems to be Amelia Earhart, and she says, these two GIs dug up my body. Yes, I know that's true. But they only got my arm. Well, then where are you? She said, I'm there. Someone moved my body. Somebody who took care of me before I died. Moved my body to a more proper place. Okay, show me. Where's the place? She had the medium draw a map. She had the medium draw a map. You know the construct of my sentence. I understand that it's odd, but the medium drew a map. I had just been there. The medium drew a map of a place I had been to many times. So I recognized it immediately. Where the road went, where the water was, where the trees were. There? What's there? My skull. My teeth. And if you go, I'll help you find me. My head is thinking to myself, I don't want to go back to Saipan to go look for, I don't want to be one of those people who spends their life looking for stuff. And she had even said, you know, people who have been digging me up, stop looking for me. I'm here. I'm on the flip side. You don't have to look for me. I'm okay. You know, it's bones. I'm fine. Okay. So the this, this session ended and I was driving away and I got a phone call from a government agency friend of mine who I very trust his opinion. And he said he had just been looking through some records that he had discovered. And he was telling me that all my research about what happened to her, how she landed in Millie and been arrested by the Japanese and taken aside, all true, all part of the record that he was able to find. He said, but Rich, here's the weird thing. When they dug up her body, they only found her arm. Not something I could know. Not something the medium could know. Only one person knows that. And it was the person talking to me from the flip side. The fact that it would happen 10 minutes after this conversation gave me pause. And subsequently, I have done the forensic research to find that was accurate. I found the article in Chicago Tribune in 1977 where they interviewed those two guys. And they said, we only dug up her arm and a partial rib cage. My point is not about Amelia Earhart. Honestly, I'm not here to talk to you about that. I'm here to talk to you about the fact that we can communicate with our loved ones it's not impossible to do. They may be busy. I actually, one, one friend of mine, who I interviewed his, while he was under deep hypnosis, um, he was talking to his mother, 
And so he asked her, so what's the process, Mom? Like, how do I communicate with you? I mean, sometimes I think about you, but I don't hear from you for a long time or whatever. I don't hear from you at all. And she said, honey, it's like a cell phone. When you pick up a cell phone, you have no idea how it works. But you push these buttons, and your loved one answers. We can't always get to the phone. Or we can't answer you because we're not energetically aligned but we hear your message and we will answer you when we can and how we can. I was on Coast to Coast, the radio show last Friday and I mentioned this story and the next morning a guy wrote to me, email, he said, you know, I was there hearing your talk on Coast to Coast last night and you said this thing, you know, about people always exist and I was thinking about my dad and I thought, gee, I wonder how my dad is. And the next morning, his friend texted him and said, I had this fantastic dream about your dad last night. He, he wanted me to tell you he's totally fine. The message came from not him because his tuning is different. We're all tuned differently, obviously. Mediums, some of them can hear, sense things, tuning-wise. And, and my challenge to people when they talk to mediums is, not, don't ask about your future. Allow that it's possibly not set in stone, or you're not supposed to hear it. <clears throat> Allow that your loved ones who are trying to reach out to you are having a hard time doing it. And ask your loved ones specific questions. They can't be, how are you? Where are you? I'm fine and I'm here. Those are the answers. <laughs> the question should be, I don't, you know, whatever it is, whatever it is, where did you hide those car keys? What are the lottery numbers? <laughs> Which, by the way, whenever I do these sessions, I do throw lottery numbers in there because I just think it's hilarious. I'm there talking to somebody who's really serious. We're in a room. You know, there's a spirit guy who's entered. There's tears. People are crying. And I go, now tell me the lottery numbers. And in one particular case, the meeting started saying, 16, 24, 5, 3. And I was like, oh, we're so I wrote it down, and I, you know, whatever, what the heck, why not? You know, I don't know, I think you're supposed to win when you're supposed to win, I guess. But I went down and I played that number, and I won. A dollar. <laughs> and when I got the dollar, I heard a voice in my head say, not very specific, were you? <laughs> so, so look, um, I know that my delivery is colloquial. I know that I don't talk like a scientist, but I can tell you that every part of what I'm doing is about the kind of science that near-death experience is about, which is cataloging. And my point is, and my point was to Dr. Grayson and the others at, at DOPS, which is evidence that's in a courtroom that's eyewitness testimony. We all know that eyewitness testimony is subject to memory. When we're talking about previous lifetimes, think about the, whole, the stuff that could be clouding the memory of that. You know, you can't be that specific, but you can ask questions that allow you to get closer to the truth. Somebody, everyone, you know, that you're in your study is talking about a car accident, and you get a hundred different points of view from the car accident, right? And then you have people add their own spirituality. It was meant to be that he ran into this other car. I mean, there's that. They add their own filters that we all have. Can't help it. That's natural. That's why we're here on the planet. We have filters. But when you ask 100 people the same question, you, eventually you can say, well, heck, there was a car accident. I mean, there's one guy who says there was no accident. But you know, you can kind of throw that out because you got 99 other people saying there was. My point is, don't be afraid of the method of gathering information. Don't allow the centuries of, of uh, whatever what word I'm looking for, where they, you know, they abuse the scientists. You know, has anyone ever heard of Giordano Bruno? Giordano Bruno was the first, he's credited, uh, at least by a number of people, as being the first scientist philosopher. And he was burned at the stake. Why was he burned at the stake? Because he had an out-of-body experience. And he had the gall to tell people about it. And in his out-of-body experience, 
He flew through the heavens. He saw that the earth revolved around the sun. He saw that the planets all revolved around the sun. And he went on to other galaxies and saw that they had the same celestial qualities in 1500. Way before Galileo. And he came back and he told people. Also, he had this incredible uh, memory gift. He could remember, whatever it's called, you know, it's like a, I forget the name of it, but you know, you remember everything, you know, from, yeah. And so he could, he would go into courts in France and he would do memory tricks, you know, I've read a thing, you know, I'll, I'll read from memory, blah, blah, blah. And so they said, oh, that's satanic, that's satanic. And then he was teaching that at his university in Genoa and the Catholic Church said, enough of that. And uh, so they brought him back down to Rome and they tied his tongue. That's where the word tongue tied comes from. They didn't want to hear any more of that stuff about out-of-body experiences. They tied his tongue and they burned him at the stake. But it was an out-of-body experience that gave us our knowledge of the universe. So do not fear people who tell you that this is crazy. Don't fear that they don't like your methodology. Don't fear when they say to you, uh, I, I don't understand it, I don't have that experience, so therefore yours must be false. Because ultimately, what is science but putting data on the table and not judging it from a previous point of view, but judging it for what it is and what it can be. Tell me how many more minutes I have. Anybody? How many more minutes do I have? Eight. All right. Good for. Thank you. Eight. <laughs> you have four seconds left. <laughs> All right. So uh, you know, I just, I naturally, I don't even know what it is. I have a time clock. I was going to talk to you a little bit about Jesus, but I, but we only have eight minutes. But I, I just want to say really briefly, I think it's very fascinating because when people, I was talking to Paul Oren at the Newton Institute, and I said, "Do you have any consistent reports from about anything?" And I was, I thought he'd say the Holocaust because I had filmed a couple of people who remembered lifetimes in the Holocaust. And instead of saying that, he said, no, I've had consistent reports of, of people who had a lifetime where they knew Jesus. And I thought, wow, what? Really? Well, did they describe what he looked like? Because, you know, if they all said red hair and freckles, you know, maybe that's the same guy. The next day after I had that interview, a friend of mine, a close friend of mine, we were doing an interview, and I, I put it flip side, and she remembered this lifetime of knowing Jesus. I thought that was so strange. And so I said, what does he look like? You know, she described this guy in great detail, color of eyes, hair, blah, blah, blah. I just want to tell you, I've had a dozen people show up on my doorstep, out of the vapors, out of the ether, out of the blue, reporting some version of that same story consistently, and showing up in sessions while people are under hypnosis, where they suddenly say, Jesus is here. And in one of my casual conversations with a Jewish friend of mine, who's not super religious, but he's Jewish, and he said, there's a guy who looks like Jesus here in this memory that we're talking about. And, he, and then he like afterwards he made a point saying, well, I don't believe in Jesus. I said, well, no, dude, it's not about belief. He showed up in your past life memory living in Cairo. You were in Cairo in the year 20, and you sold him some cloth. I mean, that's, that's not a religious memory. That's just a memory. Allow it to be what it is. Anyway, his reports were so consistent that I put him in this book, Hacking, Hacking the Afterlife. And I did it reluctantly because I know it's a bugaboo. I go into a Catholic brain freeze when I hear his name. I did when you mentioned that person seeing Jesus or Mary. We go into this brain freeze. But once you access people on the flip side, if you can, you hear really quickly, time is different over there. Somebody who lived 2,000 years ago, relatively, is like 20 movies ago. So they see us over here in a different time frame. We see them over there in a different frame. We experience it differently. And all I can say is, um, I, it's, a, it's a warning. If this is going to offend people, don't pick up the copy of the book. I don't want to offend people. But I do follow that up. And that's what I think we should all do. Follow up. Follow up. It could all be wrong. It could all be false. It could all be fake. But we'll never know unless we follow up. And that's it. What Go does ahead. Jesus look like? Sorry? So what does Jesus look like? <laughs> well, the dude consistently shows up in, like I said, there were three, uh, two mediums who claimed that they were, could converse with him. One, 
who, while I was interviewing her, I said, well, let's talk to him. They both had the uh, unusual experience when he got close to them of bursting into tears, their faces turning red and tears coming down their eyes. And I, instead of saying, well, Jesus is in the room, said, Jesus, what are you doing? Why are you making people suffer like this? They can't breathe. And, and then I said, step back. And then she was able to recover. And I said, why is this happening? Every time people talk to you, you can't breathe. They, can, they, they have this weird, and he said, he said, because my energetic construction is closer to source, that's why they experience a feeling of unconditional love when they're around me. It's overwhelming. And then he gave her an image of all the avatars in history, like a thousand avatars went through her head, Krishna. Other people who also were energetically composed of this, on a, such a way that when you got close to them, you went, this is a holy person. This is a person who's closer to God. The definition of God. In, in one of the sessions I was filming, I asked, I brought a skeptic to the session. She said, I want to know who God is, because she didn't believe that there was a God. She's an atheist. But she quickly went into a previous lifetime. She went to the Kash, her Kashuk library, talking to an elder who was up there conversing with her. She said, my question is, who or what is God? His answer was, God is beyond the capacity of the human brain to comprehend. It's just not physically possible. However, you can experience God by opening your heart to everyone and to all things. Wow. Unconditional love. If you can open your heart to everyone, even the guy pointing a gun at you, even the person you don't want to vote for, unconditional love for everything and all things, you can get a glimpse of what that feeling of unconditional love is. Today, now, consciously, not unconsciously, not in a near-death experience. Right now. I thought that was pretty fun. Oh, sorry, so Jesus, he shows up as a very tan, very tan, Caucasian, possibly European heritage. Consistently the word tan. Not of the region. Brown hair, brown eyes with golden flecks, because I had somebody say, what color is eyes? And she said, brown. I said, well, there, is there any gold in there? And she went, how'd you know? I said, I, I've heard it. Is that him? I don't know. Here's the point. Just what I was saying earlier. People appear <coughs> as they're supposed to appear to you. OK? Jesus or your grandmother or anybody doesn't exist, per se. But their energetic pattern, they have the ability to Present as I'm presenting myself as rich today. Overweight guy, blue, blue shirt on. I'm presenting myself as Richard. I can't see myself. You see? You can. You perceive me as this. And if I showed up to you in a vision, in a dream, God forbid, I show up in your house and I'm talking to you, you have to go, is that Richard? Is that my imagination of Richard or is that how I know Richard? And I'm just choosing my energetic pattern as you would know me. I don't show up as a priest in Kerala that I remember, the Brahmin priest, many, many, many lifetimes ago, the Native American Indian that I, my first session I saw that myself as and could not believe it until I was forensically able to discover this guy and his tribe and exactly what he said happened. We have many, many, many lifetimes. None of us are special. None of us are different than anybody else. Over there, there's no hierarchy. Just young souls and old souls. The old souls respect the young souls. The young souls respect the old souls. This is not my opinion and not my belief. This is what they report consistently, whether it's through an NDE, an out-of-body experience, under deep hypnosis, or through a medium. That make sense? Anybody else? You in the car, please. Um, the mediums and the channeling seems to go into like a, almost like a spirit world. And being that it is that, or maybe that. Is it? I'm not sure. Well, I mean, isn't it just like swimming in a different swimming pool? Possibly. But my question is how could one be sure that there's not a wise but benevolent forces involved in that process? Well, because it's not in the data. So all I can say is I've been doing this for 10 years now, 
and the data is consistent. Once in this temporal, in this plane that we're on here, when we, ch we live in a polarized planet, good and bad. And when we die here, if we choose to stick around, we can still participate in this good or bad planet. Once we move back beyond that threshold, beyond that light, time exists in a completely different fashion and there is almost no reports of anything dark, evil, demonic back there. Zero. Right, I'm talking about connection from here to there. So, but I'm saying you are in charge of that connection. And my point is this, a medium is just helping you ask the questions. You have a, and this is an unusual construct, but out of all the people I've talked to, we only bring about a third of our energy to the planet. Two thirds of our energy is always back there in this other realm. Having classes, I mean, it's very strange what they say we're doing back there. So only a third of your energy is here. This is what they say consistently, roughly, anywhere from 20 to 40 percent. So the question is, why did you choose this lifetime? Why did you choose previous lifetime? Or Let's say you have some experience that's beyond your capacity to understand and to feel spiritual. Why did you choose to experience that? What's, how is that leading you in a spiritual way? My point is, there's no one back there sort of dictating how we behave or who we are or any of that stuff. There's no negative forces. We are the forces. We are the people who choose. And when we get back there, we have to account for our actions with our loved ones, our soul group. That's the only people that we really relate to. And there's an average between 3 and 25, roughly. If you want to think of who's in your soul group, think of everybody in your life that's profoundly affected you. Those are the people you respond to. Anyway, sorry, Mike, went on. Go ahead. Yeah, I just got two points. Uh, one, you didn't mention the levels 1 through 5 and how we progress with our souls that Newton talks about. And two, um, you, you know I am the Federal Institute of Noetic Science. Yeah. I went to one of their meetings where I met a man who was a device assistant for talking to souls directly mm -hmm. into the sun without meeting. And essentially he had figured out how to take their frequency of about 20,000 CPS and bring it down to ours, which is about five or 600 CPS. And he was doing it through a transistor radio. And he's making oh, a okay. spot. Sure, I think I've heard about this guy. And it, it's phenomenal to see. He's only edited this film. He hasn't released it anywhere yet. I've seen some footage of a guy in Italy who was a transistor radio that right. committed. He, he but talks about other people living in Europe. And it, he talks about one group or somebody. I can't remember the details now. Yeah. But he worked with somebody, not the filmmaker, but another person. And that person died. And they had an agreement before he died that they would try to communicate cool. after he died. And they did. That's so cool. Well, I just, to, to make this point really quickly, when you have somebody channeling somebody out there in the great beyond, you've got to remember, we have our lifetimes, and then we graduate eventually after many of our lifetimes, and possibly being a spirit guide. And so the point is, the spirit guide is not omniscient. So if you channel an Edgar Casey, for example, who I interview a guy who channels Edgar Casey, quote unquote, Edgar wasn't omniscient. He had a likely scenario of what would happen. He was always wrong when it came to predicting the future. And you'll find most channelers are wrong when it comes to predicting, because the future's not set. We have free will. We can screw it up. We do. But they are correct. Edgar Casey was super correct when it came to helping heal people here from asking his counsel, which is the question I interviewed in the book, the channeler. So I got to ask Edgar direct questions. You know, who is it you're talking to? Who were you talking to when you were channeling? And he introduced me to this group of seven other people. So that was trippy. But, but what about the five levels of our soul development as we do? You know, once we get into the numbers, how do we get to the, past the fifth level to God? Here's the thing. There, once you get into this, you know, levels, right? And, and the, the filters of levels. I know we've got to wrap it up. Once you get into those levels, you're talking about somebody's experience who said, I see five levels. I've talked to people who've seen 25 levels. I've talked to people who've seen many, 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 myriads, you know, endless levels. So there isn't, a, it's not that simple of a progression. And I may, I may sound simple. I, I'm talking about the tip of the iceberg. You have to keep doing your research. But ultimately, it's so much important. Why did you choose to be here? That's the question. Why did you choose to be here? Who are you here to help? Teach, learn from. 
Everything else is icing. We'll get there. We'll figure it out. Go ahead. One more. Go ahead. Are you, you talk about the cycle of continuous rebirth. Is this something that you are required to participate in? Let me ask you. Are you? To be completely honest, I hope it's not something. <laughs> All right. Well, that's the answer. The answer is you choose to be here. You do it because your friends beg you. I need you to play the role of my father because you were so good back in the Viking era. You're the best guy because I'll never learn the lessons I want to sign up to learn unless you do it. You say, oh, I don't want to play that role. I've not done that. I'm bored with that. And then your other loved ones say, come on, dude, really. Come on. You can, you're so good at it and you can learn these other things yourself. And you sign up just like a stage. You sign up to play the role on the theater. And you can get here and go, oh, I hate it. You can sit it out. We have free will. People can say to you, will you play this role? You can say, no. Have fun. Go amongst yourselves. There's no rules. Anyway, we got to run. Let's give Richard here. There you go. There you go.